All right, so we're starting to slow down for a little bit, but we have a few introductions here so we can get started and folks will trickle in as we're being introduced. Welcome everyone uh, to Lexington Historical Society and Lex Pride's joint program, LGBT History 101. We are so pleased that you're able to join us here this evening. My name is Sarah McDonough and I'm the programs manager at the Lexington Historical Society. If you haven't been to one of our webinars before or a webinar in general, they are pretty easy to use. If you hover your mouse down at the bottom of your screen or it might show up at the top of your screen if you're on a mobile device, you will see a number of different options, uh, ways you can interact with us. There's a Q&A button if anyone has questions over the course of the program. That button is there. That's the easiest way to make sure that your questions go directly to us and don't get lost in any discussion. There is also a chat function if you'd like to talk amongst yourselves about what's happening. And I will be monitoring that. So if any questions end up there as well, I will be able to see them. We also have closed captioning available tonight. So you should also be able to see that down at the bottom of your screen. If there are many icons down there, you might have to click the little dots to make sure more of them show up. So if anyone has not been to a historical society program before, our mission is to interpret not only our 18th century revolutionary history of April 19th, 1775, but all of Lexington's history through time um, across every type of intersectionality that we can hope for. Um, to teach about it and to preserve it. So that's what we're going to be talking a little bit more about tonight. And Lex Pride um, has very nicely joined up with us uh, to help us do that. So to explain a little bit more about what they do, I'd like to turn things over to Valerie Overton. Hi, thank you, Sarah. So I'm Valerie Overton, my pronouns are she, her, and I am co-chair of Lex Pride. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Lex Pride, we are a nonprofit organization that works to develop community and advance full equality for LGBTQIA plus people and their families and allies. Um, and I always like to say that we intentionally take an intersectional approach to our programming because we are people who span all different kinds of demographics, whether that's by uh, race or faith or uh, abilities and disabilities, socioeconomic status and so forth. And because of that, you know, as uh, Dr. Martin Luther King so eloquently stated, we believe that no one is free until we are all free. So we support efforts to foster equality for all peoples. Um, we do a lot of different kinds of programming, uh, educational, professional development, community, uh, social and networking, uh, programs for youth and parents and care caregivers and so forth. So if you'd like to check any of that out, just check our website at lexprideMA.org. Um, before we get started, I'd also just like to acknowledge the traditional lands of the Massachusetts Pawtucket and other indigenous peoples on which we meet today. Uh, even though we are meeting virtually, we are people who live, work, learn, visit, or play on this land. And so we acknowledge the land because we usually talk about indigenous peoples in the past, past tense when most were enslaved or relocated or killed in genocides. Um, but we do know that their struggles continue to this day. So as activists and historians and folks who honor the truth, we honor and support indigenous people uh, who have stewarded this land and those who continue to work for justice and self-determination. Thank you, and I'll turn it back over. So I'd like to thank um, Joan Alacqua for joining us from the History Project this evening. We are so excited to learn more from you. Thank you for having me. All right, folks, we're sharing my screen. And there we go. So um, our, our plan for this evening is to share with you a little bit about how 
um, the, the history project does LGBTQ history, how we collect it, how we interpret it, how we found LGBTQ people uh, throughout time. Um, and then we'll share some information with you about current efforts of ours, of Lexington Historical Societies, and some other projects that are going on uh, in Massachusetts and across America right now to collect local and, and really social history. So uh, thank you both so much for inviting me here. And thank you to everyone who's here tonight to, to take part in this conversation. There will definitely be time at the end for questions and hopefully some discussion as well. So here is our <laughs> overview of our, our LGBTQ history lesson. Um, so the History Project, we are Boston's LGBTQ community archives. We've been around since 1980 and it's our uh, mission to document, preserve and share LGBTQ history. We focus on Boston and Massachusetts first and then New England regionally. So our collections uh, basically show the lives and experiences of people from uh, all over our region. Uh, our oldest collections that we have date to about the 1940s, our newest collections are from last year at this point. And we make a point to ensure that LGBTQ stories and history is both saved in perpetuity for the community and uh, as easily accessible to people as possible. So we're an independent archives. We're looking to open up to the public again in July, um, knock on wood. But in the meantime, if you want to learn more about what we do, I, I invite you to come check out our website at historyproduct.org. Uh, I also wanted to introduce myself and sort of my role here. Um, I'm executive director of the History Project. I'm also a public historian and archivist. And it's my job to really illuminate stories that have been hidden or ignored over time. Um, acknowledging that I am a white cisgender lesbian doing this work. Um, so it's really my privilege to be able to do it. Um, and, you know, sometimes we're talking about people who ha don't have the same experiences as I do, and I try to do that as thoughtfully as possible. Um, I will say as a note on language, I love the word queer, but I'm a millennial, and I understand that not everyone is on board with using it to describe the community as a whole. Um, historically speaking, we try to use the terms that people would have thought of themselves as during their lifetime. Um, but we're talking to each other in 2021, so I tend to, to kind of defer or, or fall back on gay, lesbian, bisexual, and so on and so forth. Um, so I think those are all my, my sort of <laughs> caveats before we start. Uh, but again, if you have questions for me or if you want to learn more, please feel free to ask. Uh, the sources for most of the, the figures that we're talking about today actually come from history project research. We, we put out a book in 1998 called Improper Bostonians. Um, and then I've done some additional research into newspapers, contemporary records, oral histories, and, and so on and so forth. So I'll kind of point out how I know about these things as we go along. Uh, the, the image you're looking at in this slide is from uh, our archives of ourselves uh, from 1980. And uh, when the History Project got together, a lot of historians or most historians and most historical organizations weren't really interpreting LGBTQ history. It was being hidden, records were being destroyed um, or you know, sort of obscured. Uh, and I'll point out a couple of times throughout history that we know that that's happened either by family members or overzealous zealous archivists. Um, so when the History Project founders came together, they really did it to uh, encourage people to share and save their own stories so that the future would know about what it was like to be gay or lesbian in the, the 80s and before, but also to show people that we have always been part of America and part of the history um, of this place. And so, our first two kind of historic LGBTQ figures that I wanted to talk about, um, one is contemporary and one dates to the 1700s. So on the left is a picture of Geo Sokmata Neptune. And um, they are uh, a modern person. They uh, identify as two-spirit in Massachusetts pre-colonization. We know of Native American and indigenous communities where there were accepted same-sex relationships, depending on the tribe or group, 
uh, people who we would now probably call or describe as gender fluid, who might be part of our, our modern trans community. And prior to the Puritans landing in Massachusetts in 1620, uh, nations of native people lived across America and, and Valerie's land acknowledgement was very thoughtful and very well done. Um, you know, the tribes actually in the part, I'm down in Quincy. So um, down here, we're talking about Massachusetts, Wampanoag uh, and Pawtucket among other tribes of indigenous people who lived in this area. So specific to native identity, but not actually coined until 1990 is the term two-spirit. And two-spirit is considered an umbrella term for indigenous people who consider themselves to have masculine and feminine spirits. Um, that is to say, not all trans native people consider themselves two-spirit, not all tribes or group use the term, but it's been a term that's been reclaimed over the past 30 years, um, in part to acknowledge what colonization tried to erase um, and assimilate. So uh, GSF Mata and Neptune, who's pictured here, um, they are a member of the Passamaquoddy tribe. They live up in Maine. And uh, historically speaking, they are the first trans person elected to public office in Maine. Um, I encourage you to actually look them up and look at their work. They do really, really beautiful art. Um, and they've been a very vocal advocate for the past several years for essentially queer native people. Um, on the right is an image uh, from a book and I didn't write down the name of the author of the book. Uh, it's the end of Pride Month, everyone. So I'm a little scattered in my notes, but um, this is the Public Universal Friend. And so uh, the Public Universal Friend was uh, born in Rhode Island in 1752. And um, as a young adult, the uh, public universal friend suffered a severe illness. Historians think that it might have been uh, typhoid, I believe. Um, but as a result of this severe illness, they reported having died and been reanimated by God. Um, that the person that they were before was no longer um, alive, and that now that they, they were a genderless evangelist and took the name the Public Universal Friend. They refused to answer to the previous name they held any longer, um, and when visitors asked if it was the name of the person they were addressing, they uh, ignored or chastised those people. Um, they just shunned the name completely, uh, and essentially took on this new identity um, as, as somebody who we might consider now to be part of the, the non-binary community. Um, they asked not to be referred to with gendered pronouns in any uh, correspondence or in person or in personal writings. Um, and so you'll see in, in diary entries from people who knew the public universal friend, they write out the full name, or they shorten it to the friend or the PUF. And they wore really androgynous clothing, um, frequently saying, I am that I am, uh, especially if somebody asked what their gender was. Um, they preached throughout Northeastern United States. They attracted many followers uh, who became the Society of Universal Friends. And um, I, I believe they, they lived the rest of their life in upstate New York. Um, Depending on who's interpreting the history of the Friends, sometimes you see them listed in women's history because they were assigned female at birth. You sometimes see them listed as a, a transgender person. Um, Michael Bronsky in particular, a local historian, calls the Friend an instance of an early American who publicly identifies as non-binary. And so for someone during this time period, the reason why we know about the friend is because people wrote about them. Um, what they were doing and how they lived was uh, paid attention to. Uh, they promoted their preaching. Oh, and Jennifer's asking in the chat, does it have anything to do with the Quakers? Yes, it does. Um, the friend's theology, and I'm gonna be honest, most of the history I do is like 1800s and, and further. So I've, I've just recently really dug into the friend. <laughs> um, and so I have a lot of really involved notes on the friend um, that their theology is very broadly similar to Quakers, believing in free will, opposing slavery, um, supporting abstinence. Uh, there, and 
as we get to the end, I'll find you some more resources on the friend. In the last couple of years, a lot more has been written about them. I think in particular because uh, the non-binary identity has been gotten so much more attention over like the last five years that folks are looking for historic figures to refer back to. Um, and the friend is, is one of those figures throughout time. Uh, moving a little bit further in time, um, during the Revolutionary War, there are two people who we might consider part of the LGBTQ community. And again, this gets into how historians interpret and read between the lines of history. Um, people that we know about before the modern LGBTQ rights movement um, are either known to us because they were written about, um, because of their infamy, because they were arrested, because they were tried or, or talked about publicly in some way, um, or we know about them because they had the privilege to write about their, themselves and their relationships. Um, and these two figures are uh, kind of examples of, of that sort of reading between the lines that we have to do sometimes. Uh, on the left is a picture of Deborah Sampson, uh, who you may have heard of. Uh, she disguised, disguised herself as a man and joined the Continental Army in 1782, and she used her deceased brother's name, um, so she mustered in as Robert Shirtleff. She bought, fought in several battles, she was injured, her quote, true sex was found out, and she was honorably discharged for her actions. Uh, later in life, she wrote a book about it, and that's what this image is from. It's the frontispiece of her memoir. Um, and part of writing the book was so that she could petition to receive an army pension, uh, and she wanted her husband to receive spousal benefits. So her 1797 biography implies that she had romantic liaisons with women while disguised as a soldier. As a historian, I don't know responsibly if I would call her by a, a modern term for what her experience was. Um, but you know, something sort of queer is going on with her, something that is subverting uh, traditional gender roles, at least during this time period. George Middleton similarly served in the Revolutionary War. Um, the, the image of the home there is George Middleton's house. It is the oldest extant house on Beacon Hill. And uh, the history of George Middleton is kind of fragment, uh, fragmented. Uh, his year of birth is unknown. We know that he was the leader of the Bucks of America, which was an all black Revolutionary War regiment. Um, and we know that he built his house in 1787. Uh, the image on the left is the flag of the Bucks of America. It is owned by the Massachusetts Historical Society and they have digitized it so that we can share it with you today. As far as I know, an image of uh, George Middleton does not exist. So uh, Middleton built his house on Beacon Hill after the Revolutionary War, um, and he built it with his friend who was a hairdresser, and his friend's name was Louis Clapion. Uh, according to some historians, uh, Clapion and Middleton reportedly lived together as a couple uh, for the first four years or so of living in this house together. And then in 1781, Clapion got married to a woman and they split the house in two. And as the story goes, if you look at that front door, at one point there were two front doors and a split down the middle of the house. Um, some sources suggest that Middleton may have married, but a wife doesn't show up in census records. Uh, and upon his death in 1815, he left his estate to Tristram Babcock, who was a mariner and good friend. Uh, so the, the relationships that Middleton has with Clapion and Babcock, from what we can see, suggest that he may have been what we would in modern time call gay. But we're not entirely sure. And until the last two years or so, um, basically the History Project was the only organization really interpreting him, him in that way, looking at his story and comparing it to others from that time period and saying like, this isn't quite what the, the norm would have been. Um, now the National Park Service is looking more closely. His house is on the, the uh, National Black Heritage Trail in Boston. Um, but since he never wrote about himself and the only things written about him were about really his military service, we're not entirely sure what was going on in his personal life. Um, and the further back we go, the more we have to do that until we get to, especially in the 1800s, uh, literary figures who are writing about themselves 
um, at length. So you're looking at here from left to right, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Herman Melville, and Emily Dickinson. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson was an influential thinker, poet, transcendentalist. Um, he kept a journal throughout his life, but in particular while he was a student at Harvard, and he was totally obsessed with another guy whose name was Martin Gay, which is kind of funny. Um, Emerson would wax poetically about Gay. Uh, he wrote at length about his interest in him. Um, he edited and removed portions of his journals later in life, but there's still a lot written about his crush on Martin. He talks about it for about two years. Uh, and there are also sketches of Martin in the journals. Thoreau, on the other hand, um, wrote publicly about his interest in other men at different points in time in his life, um, in his poetry, both his poetry and in his personal writings. In 1839, he wrote a love poem called Lately Alas, I Knew a Gentle Boy um, about someone who he spent the summer with. And I'm going to read you a couple of lines from that piece. So was I taken unawares by this? I quite forgot my homage to Congress. Yet now I'm forced to know, though hard it is, I might have loved him had I loved him less. Which is a nice poem. Uh, the, the next two authors here, uh, we know about uh, in, in part because Herman Melville wrote about the two of them. Um, so Nathaniel Hawthorne, born in Salem, spent most of his life in Concord, which is next to Lexington, which is as close as I could get in this presentation to, to gay history of Lexington at this point. Um, so Nathaniel Hawthorne and uh, Herman Melville had met one another and Herman Melville developed an intense and pretty brief infatuation with Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, the reason why it was brief was that uh, Melville turned it on in a big way and Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, turned him down rather quickly, thought that he was coming on way too strong. Um, Melville went into a depression about it. Uh, he wrote a poem about the loss of his love and, uh, you know, kind of retreated to go write Moby Dick, which is set partially in New Bedford. And if you reread it with, through sort of a queer lens, there's a lot of uh, male interpersonal relationship love energy going on there. Um, so it's also said that Melville had an eye for handsome young men throughout his life. Uh, Emily Dickinson, who is the token woman on this slide, uh, she was from Western Massachusetts and she was intense in her ardor for several women throughout her life. Uh, and that included her sister-in-law, Susan Gilbert, and then later Gilbert's childhood friend, Kate Scott. Um, and Emily Dickinson, the majority of her poetry was made available after her death in 1886. Uh, it said that her family didn't know she was so prolific and that they heavily edited her poetry to remove references to her female love. Um, a poem about Kate Scott does exist from 1860 and I'm gonna read it to you now. Her sweet weight on my heart a night had scarcely deigned to lie when stirring for a belief's delight, my bride had slipped away. Similarly, uh, historic sites and, and organizations dedicated to the history of Emily Dickinson are looking more closely about her relationships with women, um, and they are beginning to interpret the intense female friendships and I think sometimes romances she had with people in her circle. Um, and as time goes on, essentially, organizations are doing this more and more. They're taking a closer look at um, people who they may have interpreted as not being romantic or being spinsters or bachelors or, or that, those sorts of words, um, and really looking at the, the interpersonal relationships they had um, to describe what is essentially LGBTQ history. So I do have in the, the latter part of the 1800s, um, several artists who we know about, uh, who again, wrote about themselves, talked about themselves, or were infamous enough to have newspaper articles written about them. Um, so starting left to right, you're looking at Ammonia Lewis and her sculpture Forever Free, then Harriet Hosmer and her sculpture Medusa, 
and then Charlotte Cushman, who's standing uh, next to Eben, Emma Stebbins, who's sitting. And so Edmonia Lewis was born in 1844 from, uh, and, and her heritage is Black and Ojibwe Native American. Um, she often mythologized her early life, so we're not entirely sure excuse me, exactly when certain things happened to her in her early life. Um, we know that she was born in upstate New York. She spent most of her childhood in Newark, although um, she described her teenage years as, quote, until I was 12 years old, I led this wandering life, fishing and swimming and making moccasins. I was then sent to school for three years, but was declared to be wild. They could do nothing with me. Uh, we do have records of her grades. She was actually a really great student. Uh, she later went on to study at Oberlin College, where she experienced extreme prejudice as one of only 30 students of color. Eventually, she was forced to leave the school without graduating after a series of incidents, uh, one in which she was accused of poisoning her classmates, another one where she was accused of stealing art supplies. And that's how she came to Boston. She was interested in sculpture, uh, and she wanted to train as a sculptor. And she was turned down in part because she wasn't white and in part because she was a woman. Um, she eventually came to work under Edward Augustus Brackett who specialized in marble portrait busts. A lot of Edmonia's work relies on themes of like American wilderness, on themes of emancipation um, that were super popular at the time. And she kind of had this mythical background that she crafted for herself to help her be really successful. Um, in 1865, she moved to Rome and joined an active community of American and British artists living abroad. And that's when she kind of hooks up with this group of women who are, uh, I would say essentially mid 1800s lesbian sculptors. Um, she, but Edmonia's romantic entanglements are not entirely clear. Um, again, reading between the lines, uh, how many of us who are part of the community have a token straight friend? Is there really one? Uh, but, but, you know, we don't definitively know. She didn't write about who she was romantically involved with. Most of her friends were lesbians and we know about their relationships because they journaled about them or were written about. Um, Charlotte Cushman is the one who oversaw this uh, expatriate community in Rome. Uh, Cushman had been born in Boston. She was an actress. She appeared in over 30 male roles in theater throughout her career. Um, I think that she's the inspiration for Sarah Waters tipping the velvet, but I've never uh, been proven. No, no one's ever proven that hunch of mine. Um, and so she oversaw this colony. Uh, her lovers included Emma Stebbins, who she's photographed with, and Harriet Hosmer, who's pictured in the middle there. Um, and so the kind of story of, of all of them, Edmonia gained international acclaim for her work, some of which is available to look at at Mount, Saint, or Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. Um, and then she died in the early 1900s. Historians for about a hundred years after her death didn't know what happened to her um, because she kind of went from being incredibly famous and then her artwork style went um, out of style. And so uh, she ended up dying in the UK and uh, a historian discovered her death records in the early 2000s. Uh, a marker was placed on it uh, in London after a crowdfunding campaign to acknowledge where her final resting place was. So those are my <laughs> 1800s people. Like I said, as we get closer to the future, we know more and more about um, people who are part of the LGBTQ community because they were out during their lifetimes or they talked about their relationships or they left behind documentar documentary records about their experiences. And so um, heading up to that modern period, I wanted to spend some time to share information about organizations that have been active in the Boston area um, that we have records about that show kind of the the intersectional nature of our community and also the fact that LGBTQ history is not uh, a monolithic history of, you know, white guys who wrote poems in the 1800s or something like that. I'm sure we all love Ralph Waldo Emerson, but uh, he's not the only example of somebody queer in our history. 
And so you're, what you're looking at now is an image of women from the Kambahi River Collective, uh, as well as flyers uh, or, or rather pamphlets from our archives. Um, the collective was founded in 1974. Barbara Smith is one of the founders. Demita Frazier is another founder. Um, essentially, the women who came together to create the collective found themselves not represented or centered in other uh, liberation movements that they were taking part in. Um, in particular, Barbara Smith describes attending regional meetings of the National Black Feminist Organization and feeling left out as uh, a lesbian woman. Um, similarly, if, if you compare sort of their experience to the mainstream gay liberation movement or to the feminism movement, again, you're, you're not seeing the intersectional nature of their identity as predominantly black lesbian women who came together for, to found this group. Um, they chose the name the Kambahi River Collective um, because of the historic raid that Harriet Tubman um, took part in during the Civil War that ultimately freed 750 slaves. Uh, I listened to a talk with Barbara Smith recently and she said, you know, people who know that river in real life call it the, the Cumbie River, but they pronounce the organization Kumbahi uh, River Collective. The group met regularly in the Boston area from about 1974 to 1981. And it wasn't exclusively for lesbian black women, but like I said, the majority of founding members identified as black lesbians. They created a space for themselves within the movement. And they're known in particular for releasing the Kambahi River Collective Statement in 1977. It's considered one of the infrastructural documents of contemporary black feminism. And I'm sure you've heard it quoted, but I'm gonna quote it at you anyway. Uh, quote, we believe that sexual politics under patriarchy is as pervasive in black women's lives as are the politics of class and race. If black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all systems of oppression. Members of the collective were actively involved in political struggles across Massachusetts, including desegregating Boston public schools, and in particular community campaigns against police brutality. Um, the, the pamphlets that you're seeing on the left side of your screen are from 1979. Uh, created by the collective to bring attention to the murder of 12 Black women in Boston over the span of five months. Uh, and their action culminated in a 500 person march in April of 1979. The image on the right is from 1980 from a protest in March in support of Bolana Bordy, who was uh, in the middle of a lawsuit with um, Boston City, Boston PD, with the Boston Police Department. Um, uh, over police brutality. And so the influence and I would also say the impact of the Combined Year Reflective you can see through today and, and you can really see the uh, roots of their organizing um, coming back around again, especially in the movement for Black Lives. Other groups that we know about from the Boston area include um, the, the organization that is now called QAPA, the Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance. Uh, they started in 1979 as BAGMAL, the Boston Asian Gay Men and Lesbians. Um, their founder, Songkwat Cha, uh, was a native of Malaysia and he met with two uh, Asian lesbians and another gay Asian man at Glad Day Bookstore. And they came together to form this group uh, and they're considered the first co-gender Asian queer group in history, according to an article about them from the early 2000s. Uh, in 1998, I believe they changed their name to Amalgam, the Alliance of Massachusetts Asian Lesbians and Gay Men to reflect their growing demographics across the state. Um, Chua, their founder, edited the organization's newsletter. He encouraged frank discussion of Asian sexuality, um, and in particular, he encouraged discussing stereotypes about Asian sexuality. Uh, he worked to eradicate racism within the LGBTQ community. And the work of uh, Bagmal influenced other queer Asian organizations across America. As I mentioned, uh, the group is now called the Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance. 
and they changed their name relatively early in the um, in the use of the word queer. Uh, in an article about it, one of their their members at the time talks about how they want to be as inclusive as possible to everyone within their community, and that's why they chose the word to use. Um, but I know organizations are still arguing now over how welcoming queer is as a word to the community as a whole. So I like to point out that they were such early adopters. And then we have uh, a couple of different Latinx groups that have been active in Boston over time. Uh, the earliest is El Comité. Uh, their full name was El Comité de Homosexuales y Lesbianas de Boston, but they went uh, usually by El, El Comité. And their uh, mission was to build unity and provide direction to Boston's Latinx, gay male and lesbian um, community. They also did outreach to the larger or wider Latinx community about uh, gay and lesbian life in the, the 1970s. Uh, they were particularly involved with the Boston Area Coalition for Cuban Aid and Resettlement during the Marielle boat lift when um, LGBTQ people, mentally ill people, um, ill children and other ill people were uh, cast out of Cuba and, and landed in Miami. Um, they raised funds to establish the Casa Amaria, which was the Yellow House, the first gay halfway house in the U.S. to aid and resettle lesbian and gay Marilitos. Um, and they worked in particular with queer religious organizations to get the word out about their what they were doing um, and to bring in new members. Another group that formed in the later 80s was called LESLA, Lesbianas Latinas. And their statement of purpose read, quote, we're a group of Latino lesbians who are committed to supporting each other through our biweekly meetings. We come with a var variety of experience, needs, and expectations. Our common bond is our culture, and together we share our experiences and our lives as lesbians. Our meetings focus on what is needed by the group and what's happening in our lives. Similarly to the Kambahi River Collective and to many other organizations over time, they wanted to center their identities and their intersections, intersectional identities as women, Latinas, and lesbians. Um, and so they were around for at least a couple of years in the 80s. I haven't been able to find exactly when they disbanded, but that's sometimes how the history of movements go. People move away, an organization stops meeting, or uh, people working for a common cause either, you know, get to the goal of that cause or they um, move on to something else. And so uh, unlike Quapa, which has been around for 41 years at this point, some of these other organizations have much shorter histories, but I think still similar impacts on the community. The last Latinx group I wanted to mention is uh, Latinos Unidos or Club Antorcha. Uh, the image you're looking at in the bottom right is of one of their founders, Orlando Del Valle. Um, Orlando is a friend of mine, and this is him in his self-described 2D fruity dress. Uh, I'm not sure why he's wearing it, actually. It's, it's at a Club and Torture meeting. He's never told me the background story, just that he's pointed out that that's him in the picture. Um, the, the group Latinos Unidos was founded from a focus group and survey conducted by Orlando about Latinx gay men's health, and it was sponsored by the Latino Health Institute. Um, they changed their name to Club Antorcha, and their mission was to provide a social network to develop the extended family bond and expand the visibility of Latinx gay men in Boston. Their motto is illuminating our history, lighting the present, a beacon into the future. Um, and Orlando did this work with several other co-founders. They were around for a couple of years and then ended in 1992. Um, other Latinx Queer groups have popped up over time, um, and I've seen sort of rumblings of an effort to start a new one, particularly for Latinx trans people in the Boston area. And I can pull that name if anyone's interested. And then these are some other more recent uh, images from the archives. On the left are um, protesters from the Disabled People's Liberation Front of Boston from Pride in 1990. 
on the right uh, at the top is the hashtag wicked pissed protest of 2015. And then the bottom right is the trans resistance march of 2020. Um, I wanted to take some time to acknowledge that, especially during Pride Month, that the community as a whole, or rather, there are always parts of the LGBTQ community who are looking for more support. There, there's, I think, I'm riffing everyone, but you know, when you look historically at the story of the LGBTQ community and the fight for rights over time, especially from the Stonewall riots to now, um, I think sometimes there is an idea that, you know, well, we got marriage equality. Well, we got a gay rights bill in 1989. Well, we got gay people added to hate crime legislation in, uh, or protections in 1990. Um, but there are still parts of the community that need the support and attention of the entire community to gain uh, similar access to healthcare, to housing, um, and to other basic needs. And so even though the community has come so far in really such a short amount of time, there is always still work to do and to be done. Um, and so in particular, I just wanted to bring attention to trans resistance and to the work of the Transgender Emergency Fund in Boston, which is really doing a lot of on the ground work to support the most marginalized and most uh, at risk members of our community and the work they're still doing today. Um, and that historically, for as much as we've gained, there is always still work to be done. And then looking at time, I think I promised that I was only going to spend 40 minutes. So I'm a couple minutes over that. Um, but to, to talk a little bit about how we collect this history, now that we've looked at examples of LGBTQ people throughout history in the Boston area, what my organization does now is work with people to ensure that those stories are accessible to the community and um, forever saved in the archives. Um, you can't tell, you can't write history without records. You can't write history without evidence. And so we encourage people if they have hung on to materials in their home, if they picked up flyers in a march or made a protest sign, um, if they've been involved with an organization or taken photos um, to save those materials. And uh, I mean, now in 2021, to digitize them and make them available to a wider audience. Um, there are examples of collections that we have in the archives that we received because uh, people found them on the street, especially during the AIDS crisis in the 1980s in particular, um, family members cleaning on apartments would just throw things away. Um, and there's a, a not an idiom, but an adage, I suppose, that you know, when a person dies, an entire library burns. Um, we work to ensure that no one will ever have to read between the lines again, that, that people will have access to a history that's been hidden and denied to them for centuries and centuries, uh, and to have that access to it forever. So the images that you're looking at here on the left is a group of um, Simmons students. This photo is a couple of years old now because of COVID-19. Uh, so these are probably all Simmons graduates at this point, but uh, they came in and volunteered with some of our archivists to work with original records, to um, index them, to put them into proper housing and to get them ready for researchers to come in and use. Collections that come to the History Project range from um, single folders or files of materials to multi-box collections of records of people that records that people have hung on to over time. Some include politicians, um, leaders of organizations, leaders of movements, but the majority of our collections are, are just from everyday people, people who are part of the community and people who uh, have decided to share their story with us. Um, we, the, the picture on the right is from the Trans Resistance March on June 12th. We had a, a table there. 
And uh, this summer we're working with two different uh, young people on a project to document and share Boston's Black LGBTQ community. Um, and our community curator fellow, Micah, came up with this idea to put up a board that said, name a moment in, in Boston's LGBTQ history. And so some of the dates on there uh, are dates that people came out. Um, other dates relate to, you know, high points, the, the Yes on Three campaign for trans rights, the creation of the Commission on LGBTQ Youth, um, the Dyke March, Youth Pride, Somebody wrote today, the, the Trans Resistance March. Um, other moments that are, are really tragedies in the community, the death of Rita Hester, the creation of Trans Day of Remembrance. Um, I wouldn't call Paddleboro a tragedy necessary, necessarily, but like police stings and examples of police brutality against the community um, that are all part of the history of how we got to where we are today. Um, so, some things you can do if you're interested in, in documenting your own history and working with the History Project. We do oral histories with folks, especially if you haven't hung on to documents over time or would like to tell your story in your own words to one of our volunteers. Uh, we take in collections of digitized materials and original materials. If you have a library of materials at home, um, or, or actually my favorite example of a collection coming in over quarantine was uh, someone whose partner said, if you don't get those old lesbian books out of this house, I'm going to get rid of them. So we got a huge donation of uh, lesbian books from the 80s and 90s uh, from someone's personal library. Um, and we also launched during quarantine in particular a project that we called Queer Archives at Home, uh, encouraging people to look around and see what they've hung on to that tells the story of their experience as part of this community. Um, I took a photo of and told the story of uh, the t-shirt that I designed for the first pride where I volunteered with the History Project in 2016. Other people wrote up their recollections about what it was like to work with gay community news in the 70s or what it was like to go out uh, as a trans girl in the 90s. Those ones are actually really fun stories about how many clubs they were going to and what they were up to. Um, but regardless of who you are and what your story is, you know, we want to hear it and we want to make sure that people in the future have the opportunity to connect to this common cultural past that we all have. And now Sarah is going to share some info about what Lexington Historical Society is doing. Thanks, Joan. That was wonderful. Um, so I just like to point out that much um, like you are doing at the History Project, Lexington Historical Society is um, always trying to preserve our history and trying to do it better than we and many museums have done in the past. Uh, historical societies often end up being the town's attic, essentially, and um, like many historical societies, we were founded um, sort of in the wake of the centennial in the 1880s when a lot of um, very stereotypical um, white Anglo-Saxon uh, descendants of the original settlers uh, realized, you know, quite rightly that their ancestors' um, stories from the Revolutionary War were starting to fade away. Um, but since then, many of these museums have been operating on a pretty passive basis. Um, someone's cleaning out their home, um, trying to find out what to do about grandma's things. Grandpa was a war hero. Um, and so we tend to get uh, a lot of documentation sort of a generation or two after it happens. And what we've been trying to do recently is to expand how we are collecting and what we are collecting to be more active. Um, to really show the diversity of Lexington throughout time um, and to make sure that we're not missing anything as it's actually happening historically. Um, so our archives have been working with what we call rapid response collecting, particularly over the past year uh, with the number of uh, different events that have been taking place over the course of 2020. Uh, we have a COVID-19 project uh, going on, 
And we've also been starting to branch out into different um, areas of town history that we don't have um, a lot of information about. So our new archives and research center over at Monroe Tavern um, is slated to be officially opening in October. Um, but we did give a, a brief opening to this building last year um, when one of our board members, Sean Osborne, uh, instigated a wonderful project, the Black History Project of Lexington with the Association of African Americans of Lexington. So he um, and uh, the uh, ABCL um, Association of Black Citizens came in and took oral histories. They gave family photographs, uh, family mementos. And what was really great about this was not only were we documenting Lexington's Black history, but we were also documenting Lexington's recent history. And we now have some really great materials um, from the past 50 years or so um, that we don't have for most Lexington citizens, um, just because people aren't necessarily thinking about what's in their own homes and what they have lived through as being historical. So as we work towards opening up um, our building more often and accepting um, more research requests and donations. Um, we just like to have everyone keep us in mind. If you have anything um, that is specifically Lexington related that is in your family, in your past, or even in your present um, that you think really needs to be preserved for the future, we would love to talk to you about that and to see if we can preserve it um, so that people in the future can know what Lexington was like um, even now in 2021. So you'll see more from us as time goes by about specific targeted projects like the one we did with ABCL and hopefully one um, with Lex Pride as well now that we're able to sort of use this building and gather together in it again. So stay in touch if you are interested in participating more. Awesome, thank you. Uh, for sharing that. And I feel you on the reactive versus proactive collecting. Um, it is sometimes really hard, especially if you work in a, a place that has a small budget or small staff to, to go out and, and tell people, this is what we want. We want you and we want you to be here. And, and sometimes the reactive collecting where somebody says, so-and-so was important or was a war hero or these are priceless. And then you, you sort of end up um, with a I'd say a more homogenous donor pool than, than you mean to have. Um, but it's something, it's good job, Lexington. That's, it's something that I think a lot of places really struggle with. Um, I wanted to share a couple of examples of, of projects that uh, are happening or ha have happened or continuing to happen uh, both within Massachusetts and sort of uh, across the country regarding collecting the stories of, of kind of everyday people and the stories of communities. Um, Mass Rumor Roadshow, Road which uh, is out of New Mass Boston, started in 2004, and they're a statewide event-based participatory arch archiving program. Um, and they document people, places, events in Massachusetts history through photographs and stories. And so um, they've done they've digitized something, thousands and thousands of items for people um, throughout their, uh, uh, throughout their history, throughout the time that they've been active. Um, and they invite people to come in with a photo, tell a story about their experience in a place, and they add it to the archive and they put it online so that anyone can look at it and hear that, that story and, and be part of it. So, I'm not sure if they've done one in Lexington. Um, I should have checked that, but uh, they're really, they're, they're somebody interesting to look into um, and are a really interesting snapshot of very recent and current histories and stories of communities throughout Massachusetts. Um, documenting the now is taking place across the country. Um, it's essentially a group of archivists who are working to document social media um, specifically for uh, historically significant events, but in regards to demand from scholars, from students, from archivists, 
uh, and kind of dealing with how do you document something that somebody has put publicly on the internet in a way that is uh, gaining consent from the individuals that is preserved in the long term and um, is uh, available to be easily looked at again. Um, documenting the now project stand and, and other projects really mostly work with people in college um, and, and sort of small grassroots activist groups to ensure that the history of the movements that they're part of that are uh, being really lived out over the internet kind of in real time are, are saved for the future. Um, and then StoryCorps, which you might be familiar with, uh, is an organization whose mission is to preserve and share stories in order to build connections between people and create a more just and compassionate world. If you listen to NPR, there's usually a StoryCorps story every Friday. Uh, and pre-COVID-19, I used to know if I was going to be late for work if I heard StoryCorps come on in the radio and I was still at home. Uh, they do this wonderful thing called the Great Thanksgiving Listen and encourages people to create an oral history with one another. Um, and to interview an elder, a mentor, a friend, or somebody else, you know, sort of somebody who they may have spent Thanksgiving with. And they provide information about how to do that on your cell phone, what kind of documentation you want to have. And if you submit that story to StoryCorps, they add it to their collection at the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. And something like over a half million people have participated in that, making it this huge collection of, of individual stories. Um, so, so yeah, it's <laughs> as we sort of head to the end of this presentation, um, we have a lot of time for questions, but also, you know, I just want to encourage folks, especially if you have the ability to do it, collect your own story share your own story in your own words and you know don't leave it to historians like me to try to figure out what you were up to uh during your life you know a hundred years later um it's especially you know we we all have a story and it's it's really oh there's a hamilton quote that i'm grasping at in the back of my mind again i, I apologize it's the end of pride month so i'm all i pried it out uh but you know who tells your story, you can. So I really encourage you to. Um, as far as historical content goes tonight, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat, but you can always reach out to me at info at historyproject.org. And if I don't know more about what you're interested in, I can point you in the right direction. Um, like I said, we document most of the history of sort of queer New England, um, but there are other projects in Worcester, in Seacoast, New Hampshire, at a couple different uh, universities in New England that also document LGBTQ history, as well as other um, more national repositories like the Lesbian History Archives. Uh, there's an effort for an LGBTQ museum in New York City, the Stonewall Archives in Florida, and so on and so forth. But, all right, let's see. If I stop sharing screen, that'll... We can all see each other again, right? Oh, I was spotlighted. I removed my spotlight. And let's see. All right, questions in the chat. Yes, Lexington has been done by Mass Memories. Okay, cool, then I can find you the link. Um, they put up everything that they digitize on their website. And so you can kind of cruise through what people have already said about Lexington or what they've shared. Um, and Valerie's asking, what are some ways that people can use to document history at home? Um, the answer is it depends on what you have. So if you're talking about uh, wanting to do an interview or an oral history, all you really need is a cell phone. Um, when I first started doing oral histories, and that was about 10 or 11 years ago at this point was when I think I did my first oral history interview. Um, oral historians were very serious about, you needed this kind of recorder, you needed this kind of backup. These are how many copies of the uh, interview you need to save to ensure that you don't lose it somehow or that the technology doesn't fail. Um, most people's iPhones are good enough now that you could do a really great interview with somebody um, just on your phone. 
And, and again, I would suggest looking at what StoryCorps suggests for technology. Um, but, you know, that's probably the easiest way to document someone's history. You don't have to write it out. You don't have to write a memoir or do research, really. You know, you're talking about your own experience and your own life. And again, doing that in your own words is just, it's so important. And, and that way, you know, no one else is trying to interpret or figure out what you were thinking or how you were feeling about your life at different points in time. Um, in regards to, to documents and, and books, um, I'm sure we could find some technical information if you had an example you were thinking of. Uh, the best off the cuff advice I, I have to say is don't leave things in direct light and try to keep your humidity as uh, flat as possible. That, that's usually what we're looking at in terms of conservation. Um, then again, records generally end up in attics and basements and barns. And if you end up working with an archives to document your own history, archivists have seen it all. Like I've gone, I could tell you some stories about the records in the barn in Vermont, on the farm, in the middle of nowhere that, you know, you'd probably your stuff is being saved a lot nicer than that. Oh, let's see questions. Oh, is there a national repository for LGBTQ documentation and oral histories? There's not one. Um, and, and part of the reason for that is because LGBTQ history happens on a local level most of the time. We're talking about here in Massachusetts, um, kind of local communities fighting against state ordinances. Uh, you see the community come together nationally uh, after Stonewall to commemorate the Stonewall riot, but like pride celebrations are still only happening in, you know, cities across the country and across, around the world too. Um, the, the national marches on Washington in, I think 79 and 87. I don't have my notes right here, um, but I, I'm usually, I can usually do decade really well. I think it's 79 and 87, because I think uh, National Coming Out Day is 88. But um, anyway, so, so those are times when the whole community comes together. You see fights around marriage equality on a national level, um, as well as like national actions to prohibit the uh, activities of LGBTQ history or LGBTQ people in the 90s between the Defense of Marriage Act and Don't Ask, Don't Tell. That being said, a lot of what's happening is happening, you know, on, the, on a state by state basis. Um, similar things happen in Boston and New York City, but totally different people are usually involved. So especially when we're looking at the, the history of these places, archivists like to keep records as kind of close to home to where they were created. So we do that work here in Boston. A couple of other organizations do that in, in New York City. Um, lesbian history is probably the most national of, of the LGBTQ repositories because they collect records relating to uh, I think lesbian life broadly in the world and the, the lesbian experience. And, um, but yeah, I would say if, if you're curious about sort of where to go, I can start pointing you out on where my, my archives road trip would be. Um, I would look at Lambda in San Diego. I'd look at GLBT Historical Society in San Francisco. Um, Minnesota has more than one repository. Chicago has Gerber Hart and uh, the Leather Archives and Museum uh, and, and so on and so forth. And then there's a whole Southern project called the Invisible Histories Project that's really cool too. Um, so that was a long answer for no, there's not one national repository. The Smithsonian also collects LGBTQ history at this point too. Um, Valerie is asking about how do you concern, handle concerns about being outed in history, especially for people who cannot safely come out. I think the examples I can think of are less of uh, people being outed historically in an unsafe way and more uh, straight historians arguing about the sexuality of people who are no longer here. I, I think that's the, the thing that happens more often. The, the joke is kind of like, oh, they were roommates for 40 years. And it's like, where, the, 
like, was Achilles and what is it? Achilles and, and uh, Patroclus is the like historic example of, yeah, the two of them were, were pretty gay and everyone's like, no, they were just best friends who, you know, fought in the Trojan War together. Um, so it's happening less and less. And, and actually there's uh, a lot of mostly Gen Z uh, history students making fun of older historians for for doing that sort of like but how do you know if they were a couple if we don't know if they slept together and it's like you don't have to be in the bedroom to prove somebody's sexuality or gender expression either um, I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily to uh, highlight people who may have been part of the LGBTQ community um, and you know when I'm saying someone from the, the 1800s may have been a lesbian or may have been gay. That's not the same as saying like, that person was definitely considered themselves part of this community. The language didn't exist at the time. Um, there's a really interesting uh, kind of practice around this that the, trans the Digital Transgender Archive does. Um, the Digital Transgender Archive is a, is actually, it's a national, it's an international digital collection of trans history related materials. And especially since the words used to describe trans communities have changed so drastically over time. Um, and even though like a word like transgender that's been around since the 1960s wasn't in common usage until the 90s, really, they talk about transing history that they're looking at um, sort of non-mainstream forms of gender expression and identity as all being part of the trans umbrella rather than pointing to somebody, you know, in the 1800s or pointing to the, the public universal friend and saying, well, that's a trans person, obviously, or something like that. Um, so it also gives these people who they're talking about and documenting the opportunity to describe themselves in their own words. And so they will use words like I think the most benign is like, you know, people who describe themselves as cross-dressers who we would now probably consider part of the modern trans community. And other words that I uh, won't say out of context that people used as identifying terms that we would now probably consider slurs in, in most cases. So yeah, folks in the audience, anyone? <laughs> Here's something for our collections people. Um, it might be useful to know. Have you found any types of um, items that you're given that you are surprised at how how much information you get out? We, you know, we've talked about the the problem of really sticking to war heroes and the most prominent members of your community. Maybe you weren't at Stonewall. Maybe you weren't at a march where you picked up flyers, but your story is still important. Have there been any? pieces of documentation or objects that that you've had that really stood out to show an average person's experience? Yeah, I think um, we have, I can think of two examples. Um, the, the more recent one is another collection that we got over quarantine. It was somebody who went home to clean out a childhood bedroom. Um, somebody who's, who's probably in their 30s now and uh, came out as, as part of the trans community as a teenager and kept all of the uh, like medical pamphlets that they were given as they started that sort of journey. And so that's called ephemera. Um, it's not material that you're expected to keep for a long time. You're not expected to keep a pamphlet forever. You're not expected to keep a postcard forever. Um, but objects like that, documents like that tell you a lot about both what a person is uh, finds important to know more about and hang on to, but also kind of societal norms around something. So they had pamphlets about um, hormones and rights and history and and all from the like from like 2005 to like 2015, which isn't that long ago, but is also really hard to find, um, especially because so much of that is now shared online and. Um, you know, it is gone now because it's out of date medical information, um, but really sheds a light on, on a time period in someone's life that we wouldn't otherwise really know about. The um, other example I was thinking of was a collection that we got donated uh, at an event that we did at Fenway Health. 
so we did a, a public event with a historian talking about um, it was the history of cruising, actually. So it was a very well attended event. People love topics like that. And um, somebody left us a box of materials. Uh, and afterwards, and we didn't know what it was, we left it at the, the event and someone from Fenway reached out and said, you left a box of stuff in the room. Um, someone had brought all of their uh, magazines that they had collected from the 80s and 90s and left it. Uh, and they crossed their name off of every one of the magazines on the, the mailing label on the front. So they didn't want to be identified. They didn't want to actually talk to us <laughs> about donating this collection, but they left it and brought it, they brought it and left it for us. Um, and so it turns out that they were all um, uh, magazines relating to basically gay black life in New England from the 70s, 80s and 90s. Um, materials that we, when we looked into it, were really hard to find in other repositories because, again, magazines are, are ephemeral. You you read them a few times, they end up in a doctor's office, they get recycled, um, and so it provides a really interesting and kind of rare snapshot about what the community is talking about and feeling and publishing on, in addition to like information about events and and other things like that. Um, so so now we have that in the collection. So. You know, you, you don't necessarily um, get the full story from a flyer or a postcard or another thing we have a ton of are buttons and t-shirts, which are really interesting, again, ephemeral objects that are created for a protest or an event or an action um, that, you know, show in a way what it was like to be there, but not the full story. Yeah, no, as you're talking, it, it strikes me that, um, it, you know, a lot of, of the, um, the people and events that you and groups that you talked about in the 70s and 80s and 90s, like that's my history, right? So <laughs> it's really fun to see. Um, so I guess one of the questions I have is about like kind of stitching together the narratives from different kind of um, uh, stories, oral history, stories, objects, and so forth. I mean, just thinking about organizing back then, you know, we used phone trees and zines and, you know, we, we communicated and organized in such different ways back then. Um, and, you know, how the different pieces influenced each other. Um, like the Kumbahi River Collective was so influential for me. Um, Anyway, I'm just kind of wondering, you know, when you're preserving like these objects, like how you also kind of stitch together the narrative of what went on. Yeah, and the so the really it's a historian's job to stitch together the narrative, but I'm an archivist who's also a historian. Um, <laughs> I, I sort of joke when you work in the Boston area, everyone else I knew went to Simmons and has like a library degree. I went to UMass Boston. I went to the, the state school alternative. Um, so I sort of was trained to do that kind of historical work to, to find information in more than one place and to create the story based on all of that research and gathering that you do. Um, for the time period you're talking about, actually, I think a really interesting example are stories about lesbian Avengers. And I think that today is Dyke March in New York. So there's been a bunch of articles that have come out like today about lesbian Avengers did this, lesbian Avengers did that. Um, and to, again, the, the sort of the best evidence is when people talk about it. So there's, there's this one article that is in, it might not be in the New Yorker, but I can find a link to it and share it with everyone um, because I know that I retweeted it earlier. But somebody does what's called, they, they call it an oral history of the, the lesbian Avengers. Um, and it's a short article and it has quotes from several of the women who were involved and who were founders in the early days talking about what it was like. Um, it was in the cut, which is part of, I think might be part of the, New York Magazine. Um, and yeah, to have, you know, people reflecting back on 
what their involvement was, what they remember about it, what, I mean, especially what they fought over as part of the movement, which fights don't always make it to, you know, meeting minutes, whereas, you know, other voting on things might, you know, decisions might end up there, but like, um, there, when I worked in, in archives in higher ed, there was a moment that several people in oral histories talked about a faculty meeting where people screamed at each other and a big decision was made. And the faculty minutes said, the secretary wrote, the conversation went from the sacred to the profane and back again. That's it, that was the line. And, and so, you know, luckily people who were there were still around and willing to talk about it because it was very important to the, the sort of history of the school, but you wouldn't know based on, on only having that one part of the story. Um, so anyway, the, the lesbian Avengers story is uh, enjoyable because they talk about why they got together their first action outside of an elementary school, which is the best, uh, I think one of the best civil disobedience stories I've ever heard of. Um, for those of you in the audience who don't know, and I, I don't know who I'm talking to, somebody here might be an Avenger, and uh, I hope I do the story justice. But uh, that a, a rainbow curriculum, um, a curriculum including LGBTQ people was supposed to be added to New York public schools. It was not. The Avengers showed up outside of an elementary school um, wearing t-shirts that said, I was a lesbian child and holding balloons that said, ask about lesbian lives, lavender balloons. They started handing them to the kids and kids being kids took the balloons and went into school and then asked, what is a lesbian? And they would do things like that. And they did other very direct civil disobedient um, actions. But to hear them talk about like, this is why we did it. And somebody says, yeah, I think we broke up because everyone coupled up and couples don't wanna protest which I don't know how true that is, um, but it, it really adds the, the personal to, to the historical um, and shows you that these are people who are still here and still fighting as well for, for different causes and rights, including continued rights of lesbian women. So anyway, um, does that answer the question about how a historian does research? We do a lot of, um, a lot of background research and, and a lot of organizing to make sure that we know where everything's coming from before we start making sort of arguments about, you know, who, who may or may not be part of the LGBTQ community or, or that sort of thing. Anyone has any other questions? Uh, again, there's a Q&A box down at the bottom. So we would love to hear from you. And then any just general comments? can be stuck in the chat window as well. Awesome, and I can say, um, if you are interested in uh, learning more about what we've talked about today, like some, the books behind me are real. <laughs> this is really my office. Um, so I have, I was looking at the Kambahi River Collective book recently, uh, Hyunga Yamada Taylor um, wrote what's essentially an oral history of the Kambahi River Collective called How We Get Free. It is excellent. Um, they, the editor talks to Barbara Smith, to other women involved, um, and then to uh, particularly queer women involved with uh, the movement for Black Lives Now and connections between these two groups and, and basically modern Black feminism. Um, so that's a good one. There's Improper Bostonians, which is the History Project's book. We aren't selling it any longer. And I will say it came out in 1998, so it does skew very white. Um, but, you know, stories about people who were active and alive and part of the community from before the Puritans all the way up to Stonewall are in this book, along with a lot of really great photos. Um, and you can get a pretty good used copy on Amazon. I mean, don't buy from Amazon, but, you know, <laughs> uh, from book retailers all over the internet. Um, and then the book I'm reading right now is actually called Legendary Children, The First Decade of RuPaul's Drag Race in the Last Century of Queer Life. Uh, we just talked to the authors last night about the research that went into this. And so if you're interested in, in basically the history of cross-dressing entertainment, it is uh, incredibly well-sourced. And um, I'm planning on reading it on my uh, <laughs> vacation after Pride Month is over.
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Joan, for, for joining us tonight. That was absolutely amazing. I know I learned a lot. Good, I'm glad. And I see um, there's a comment in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for, for the comment. Um, it is always my pleasure to talk about LGBTQ history. And like I said, absolutely. If anyone in the audience or anyone who watches this recording later wants to know more, please check out the History Project. Um, we do this work essentially for the community and because of the support of the community. We, we work on like a shoestring budget to make sure that the community's history is available and um, preserved so that, like I said, somebody 20, 50 years from now knows what we were up to uh, in the past and, and what was important to us. Um, and so that we are, you know, visibly a part of the history of the community of Massachusetts in general. So. So yeah, so my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'd just like to point out for those uh, who are still here, if you are interested in joining us live uh, next weekend, we are going to be having our first uh, live event since October, um, which is our annual 4th of July event. And it's gonna be held outside at the visitor center this year. Um, so we hope that you can join us for that. Um, we read the Declaration of Independence and give some background about um, what it actually means. It can be kind of hard to read an 18th century document. Um, and so uh, Freedom's Way National Historic Area has very nicely written a presentation explaining what is going on there. And there will be singing and there will be ice cream and fun will be had by all. Um, Valerie, is there anything um, amazing happening uh, I, I know everyone's exhausted from um, from Pride Month. Is there anything else coming up that um, the group should know about? Um, yeah, so uh, on Tuesday, there's uh, Lex Pride is collaborating with uh, Lex Chat on uh, a Lex Chat about um, uh, intersectionality, essentially, kind of gender, sexuality, disability, and so forth and um, how that impacts the model minority myth and, and related kinds of ideas. Um, so you can check out uh, LexPrideMA.org to uh, look at our calendar to find out information on that. And we also have a, a lot of other programming that will be coming up that is not on the calendar yet. So stay tuned. Great, so I'm just dropping all of our websites down in the chat one more time in case anyone would like to make a note of that go yeah and i i guess one other kind of collaborate collaboration that i would love to do sometime with uh with all three of our groups is to have like an lgbt kind of history project here in, in lexington because we have a lot of LGBT folks who have been active in a lot of a lot of movements, um, you know, for decades and in Lexington, and so I think that would be a really fun event to plan together. Well, it's it's an important part of history, and particularly, again, modern history. You know, when we're trying to piece together these historical figures and read between the lines, and there's a lot of guesswork and there might be, and they may have, and we are so lucky to be living in a time where enough people feel comfortable stating their own histories, um, whether it's LGBT history or otherwise. And it would really be a shame if that fell through the cracks. And especially now that so much is being digitized and we don't know where it will be held to be able to have physical copies of things where we know where they are, to be able to have multiple physical and digital copies of things is really important to our modern history and to ensure that it doesn't get lost like a GeoCity site blowing off into the wind. <laughs> oh, good. That's the stuff that keeps archivists up at night. Exactly. And then we start talking about bit rot and then <laughs> it's a whole thing. But but yeah, keep us in mind as, as you start to do more, um, especially LGBTQ history in Lexington. Um, and I was gonna say, History Project, we don't have any events planned for July yet. I know that we will have a couple, um, including we're gonna be at Bear Tea at Club Cafe, I think on, on July 18th, if anyone wants to come to a tea dance. 
Um, but we have a whole archive of all of our events from the last year on our YouTube channel. So um, if you're looking for something to listen to, or if you're just you know sort of interested in LGBTQ history in general, um, all of those events are now part of the archive, which is one benefit of having to do everything on Zoom. So check it out. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Yeah, thank you. It was really great. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Well, all right. hopefully we'll all be able to do this again in person very, very soon. Um, keep us in mind. And for, for all of you listeners, think about what you might like to share in the future. Um, and if you have any ideas about programs that we can do, feel free to drop us a line. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.